kind of modifying the curriculum and making sure that there's levels of understanding in that curriculum for the teachers so that they can implement it well. Um, they'll work for students or work with students at times if it's uh, kind of a flexible grouping, a mixed up math, where they're not only supporting the teachers, but they're also supporting uh, other students that might need extensions, they may need uh, a little bit of remediation. It gives us a little bit more flexibility in meeting the needs of all of our students. So it has been nice so far. We are looking for it to expand. Uh, I am kind of a nag, and I'd always love it to, to grow a little bit more. Um, uh, but it's going well so far. So uh, I'll keep it short. I just love for them to actually describe a typical day, just maybe something that they do. Uh, I, I hear it a lot, but just for you guys. So a typical day, I'll give you today for example, um, started out with flexible grouping. I meet once a week with um, second graders in flexible groups. So the three teachers and I can take all the second graders and split them up into four groups rather than just three. So now you have a much smaller class to deal with. The teachers are always saying, oh, it's so nice to only have 15 kids in a class. Um, you can do a lot more with 15 than you can with 20, 25. Um, and then I usually meet with teachers during planning um, and right now some teachers are working on a fraction unit and they know their kids struggled with fractions last year and so this year we're working on what other things we can add to the curriculum to really reinforce um, the concepts. Um, I go in to some classrooms in the afternoon and watch what's happening in the classroom when the teachers are teaching and the kids are learning and are the kids really getting it? Are they missing things? Are there things that need to be added that um, they're, they're not getting? So it's kind of doing some formative assessment, sort of, in that case. So that's a typical day. <laughs> Just to add on, one thing that Kirsten's also great with is the technology. Uh, a lot of our formative assessments are now being put onto the iPads. So students are actually able to, to do some of this work in a much more streamlined fashion. Our ability to collect some of the data has been much simpler. Um, it's, it's nice to be able to have that. Sorry. So I would say that my day sounds very similar to Kirsten's day. Um, we've been focusing primarily on third, fourth, and fifth this year just because we're being split by, um, in two schools, we obviously can't get to every classroom. A lot of them have math at the same time. Um, and so one of our big focuses with the third, fourth, and fifth grade has been thinking about problem solving and how do you write about problem solving and communicate about it and how do you find good meaty problems that are worth spending the time um, solving and talking about. And so um, on a typical day, I usually end up modeling one or two lessons around that um, in meeting with teachers. We, um, last week we're looking at some of the student responses and talking about how we would score them and just trying to calibrate our own thinking um, as a team about what, what that would look like. Um, and then having that same conversation with the students, giving them some samples of other students' work. I, being at two schools, one advantage is that I could bring work from the other school, so it would be totally anonymous, and give them a chance to just see, um, well, how would you score this? Oh, well, this person didn't really explain this very well. And then give them their own work back and give them a chance to say, oh, I guess I didn't explain that very well either. Well, now I have an idea about how I could do that better. Um, I think another big focus is, um, helping teachers to think about um, how to make what the kids are learning more concrete, so how to bring in um, manipulatives and different materials to model their thinking um, so that it's not the way that we all learned math where we've memorized a lot of procedures, but actually trying to understand what it is that they're doing. The coaches in general just do awesome work. I'm so proud and so happy to really have that opportunity to work with them. And I, you know, I really can't thank you guys enough for, for giving us the, that kind of support. And what's also, too, is you know, Stephanie's in the back uh, here in support of the coaches. I mean, I think it, for, for a lot of the principals and talking with them, they have really, really appreciated the fact that there is someone there on a more consistent basis, you know, not, not uh, you know, one-offs, but just someone who's there at least twice a week who's working with the teachers, working with students. It, it has been really great. So I'd love to have, uh, have any questions from, from any of you or from all of you. When you set up the flexible groups, how, what's, how do you determine the groups? Um, we've been using, in the lower grades in particular, the AMC assessments. We have assessments that we give um, periodic, periodically throughout the year based on different skills that we're working the kids towards. So 
the teachers are already giving those assessments, so then we base the groups off of that. And with each assessment, do you regroup? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Lamb? Um, it's fabulous to hear what you're doing. Some of the faces are familiar. <laughs> I know firsthand of Emily's work with the DESC, and um, so that's very exciting. I'm wondering, we know a constant challenge for elementary is that our elementary teachers tend to be, um, have a much higher level of expertise in English language arts than they do in mathematics. Um, based on the intensity of the math coaching at this time, are there any clear directions in terms of needed professional development, um, needed support materials so that we can help our staff be just as strong in mathematics at that level? Yeah, I, I, you know, really the ultimate priority for me when I think about an instructional coach is really to support that teacher for both content knowledge as well as their instructional skill set. For us this year, that first half of the year, just in terms of how it flows in my mind, was really us just getting in the doors, you know, building that trust, building that relationship. The second half of the year has really been us trying to hammer away at some of the work that we have to do and set the tone for next year. One of the uh, uh, topics that came up at our last meeting was the fact that you know, when we do focus on our PD next year, we really want to focus on the teachers doing mathematics. We really want to kind of start to challenge uh, the perception of what uh, and how uh, and all the connections that we have in the mathematics so they start to rethink um, how they teach it. You know, we all, we all do mathematics the way we were taught it. We all believe mathematics is always the way in which we taught it. So if we're expecting our teachers to teach differently or to kind of embrace other um, habits or skill sets, we actually have to start to put the teachers in a position to believe that that's a good thing. Uh, so a lot of our PD next year really will be focused on uh, working with mathematics. We are also working on a couple of other uh, kind of uh, support projects, uh, one with Harvard um, uh, in terms of looking at the quality of instruction that we have, and a large component of that is actually analyzing mathematics and analyzing how we teach the mathematics. So it is a, a huge area of importance for us, and we, we hope to, to be able to support all the teachers. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, I, was, oh, I was on it. Yeah. Can I ask you to tell a little bit more about that project you're going to do? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because you were leading. I'm sorry. We'll go yeah. back. So um, the project that we're working on uh, organizing right now, um, a researcher from town uh, who works for Harvard, uh, Heather Hill, uh, she's done some great work with uh, Deborah Ball. Um, you know, I, I kind of made a semi-joke, but Deborah Ball is, she's like the bee's knees. Like in terms of mathematics education, uh, it doesn't get any better. Um, and Heather Hill is phenomenal too. So their research was all about the mathematical knowledge for teaching, which is essentially what are the skill sets that you need both mathematically and instructionally that will really support uh, higher achievement, deeper understanding, good quality instruction. So through their actual research, they started to realize that uh, kind of a, an offshoot was that all the teachers that they were working with to do their coding for their research actually started to change their own habits of instruction. So what they've done is actually turn this into a PD program. So we're gonna be working with uh, Harvard next year, third through eighth grade. Um, uh, we're gonna start to advertise and get this out to all the teachers. It really is a great opportunity. Um, you know, it's one of those things also that I'm really, it's, it's great to know that there are such committed people in the, the, this, the school. A lot of the principals, uh, Heather Hill has actually offered to do a subsection, uh, and a lot of the principals have actually volunteered. They wanna be part of it, as well as our coaches. So we have an opportunity to really kind of, uh, next year, put good quality instruction at the forefront, try to re kind of reset what we use as our vocabulary, reset what we use as our mind frame, and reset what we think about and, and what we look for when we see the quality instruction. It's a, it is a great opportunity. Dr. Allison Anthony? I was just wondering if you could share some of the feedback that you're hearing from teachers as you've gone through the year with the math coaches, because I think this must be new and different for yeah. them. Um, I think in the beginning, they didn't really know why we were there. <laughs> um, and that they were kind of like, yeah, we know, we know what we're doing. Um, but I think as the year has gone on and we've built a relationship, I think teachers have become more comfortable with us which I think is obvious. And they're, they're really, really happy, I think, to have this resource. I think it's 
changed the way that some teachers teach already, being able to just bounce ideas off somebody else. Um, I think some teachers sometimes have questions about the math and are afraid to ask it. And so I think being one person rather than being in a room for professional development, it's, they're much more comfortable coming to me and saying, can you just explain to me you know, mm -hmm. what's going on here? So I've, I've had a very positive experience. Mm -hmm. I would agree, and some of the concrete examples are that, um, you know, we've been working on this problem-solving framework, and I walked into a fourth grade classroom that I hadn't been planning to visit just to ask the teacher a question, and all the kids were doing another one of these problems with the teacher, so she had kind of taken what we had done and was going with it, and another teacher came up and said, could you just come and observe my lesson and give me some feedback? So they're mm -hmm. coming to us now and seeking us out. I agree that at the beginning there was kind of this, why is someone else in my room observing me? Mm -hmm. um, now it's, it's much more, they have me scheduled when I'm at each of the schools, we need you in our, you know, they wanna make sure, especially since I'm split between two and a lot of them have four teachers at a grade level, so I can see each of them twice a month. Mm -hmm. And so they have me scheduled to make sure that I can get to all their classrooms on a regular basis. Cool. Thank you. It probably didn't help that we rolled this out at the same time as a new evaluation system, <laughs> which pretty much also caused a lot of stress at the beginning. So, I mean, l yeah. It's not perfect. Yeah. Our a uh, AEA rep, Miss Linda Hansen, is with us tonight. Yeah, I just want to jump in on that um, particular response because I was at a bishop um, building meeting maybe six or eight weeks ago, and they were going through grade by grade to just say what's going on in your grade and how are things going, and every single grade mentioned Kirsten's role and how much she's supporting and helping them at the grade level. Um, nobody told them to do that. It was just kind of spontaneous, but once one grade started it off, every single grade kind of was talking about how much they appreciate the support that they've gotten from her. So. Thank you. Th this is something that teachers are hungry for. When, when we look at a lot of the elementary goals, three, four, and five, that needed to be written for the new evaluation system, it's amazing how many of them focused and centered on mathematics. This is something that, I mean, it's, there's a need, there's a desire for it right now. Um, what is the math curriculum? Is there, do you guys uh, have a specific, um, like do you follow CMP or I don't, I don't so know. So yeah, in the elementary school, the backbone of what we use right now is Turk. Turk. Um, yeah, grades K, K is, um, K is a little more of a hybrid right now. I, I, you know, there's, there's other right. things happening in K. One and two uses the, um, the, not the newest version but the older version but it's been modified to meet the needs of what we're doing and then three four and five actually uses a much more updated version that we're working with modifying to really make sure it you know it's no curriculum is perfect it it needs to also meet the kids we're teaching so what we're doing right now and, and this is what's great for having a, a team is we can really differentiate modify and and start to tailor something that can meet a broader uh, group of kids as opposed to one set curriculum turn the page do the next lesson Two, two things I want to add. One is that we also use AMC pretty heavily in, in K1 and 2. That's a big focus of our work. And the other thing I just wanted to add, which I realize I didn't mention in a typical day, but is a big part, is thinking about how to enrich and provide opportunities for students who are looking for more of a challenge, which I think is another big part of our work and part of really supplementing our, our core curriculum. Because we have a large number of kids who are looking for challenges. And sometimes those aren't the kids that you originally thought would be the ones. Um, mm -hmm. So it's pretty exciting to see. Uh, Mr. Schlickman and then Dr. Allison Anthony. Yeah, I was going to mention the implementation of this program at the same year you're doing evaluation. Uh, it could have been difficult. I mean, the notion of having a support stream and an accountability stream as being two separate entities, has, has that sort of taken on so that people understand what the, uh, uh, what the design is? From my experience, yes. I mean, I think it helps that they see that we're teachers too. We get observed too and are going through the same process that they are. Um, we matched our goals um, with some of the teachers. So um, all the fourth grade teachers I work with have the same um, goal that I have. Um, and so they know that I'm as accountable as they are. So they feel like, they, I think they actually feel like I'm sharing mm -hmm. some of their stress with them. Um, <laughs> and they also will come and say, this is my goal, I need help with this, can you help me with, with working on this? Like, I have place value as a goal, but I don't really know what to do with that. So. During, um, I, I think one of the actually evaluation meetings I had w with both of these guys, 
I think I expressed the fact that uh, probably the best thing I did last year was hiring who I hired. I mean, the team we put together this year, I, I, I really can't, couldn't have been happier. They are professionals in every sense of it, and they, they understand what it means to really support the teachers. Yeah, yeah hiring matters. Uh, and, and just one question aside, you got anything special planned for tomorrow? Pi day. Pie day? <laughs> yeah, there's a couple things going on. Um, Hardy has had a whole week-long thing, and I'll let Kirsten talk about that. At the high school, we have a breakfast starting at um, 7.45, and it lasts for exactly, I mean, it, it's <laughs> as exact as we can get for 100 pi divided by two minutes. So just make sure you're within that interval, if you can. Uh, at uh, Dallin, I think, off, off week, but you had a math night last week. Um, at Odison, I want to say each of the teachers are doing something special for themselves. Um, but I'll be honest with you, I go where the food is, so I'll probably be at the high school. <laughs> um, and I think at 159, and Kirsten will say more about it, at Hardy, they're going to be uh, consuming uh, regulation. She couldn't. She might be eating some uh, district approved circular food. <laughs> <laughs> Rice cakes. Yeah. Uh, but Kirsten should tell you more about this week. Yeah, it's been math week over at the Hardy. So um, really, I think Kristen DeFrancisco and the school council over there planned most of it. But Monday morning was um, math morning, and the parents got to come in. Um, Kristen, Matt, and I spoke to them for a little bit about the curriculum and what we're doing in math. And then they got to go to their, ch their child's classroom and do math with their children and do play some of the games that they're playing right now, get to see how they are multiplying, how are they dividing. Um, I think the parents learned a lot, and it seemed like everybody really enjoyed it. On Wednesday, I wasn't there because I'm only there on Mondays and Fridays, but on Wednesday they had um, speakers come in from the community and talk about how they use math in their everyday life. And then tomorrow, it's an all-day extravaganza over there. <laughs> um, K1 and uh, kindergarten and first grade, are doing a QR code scavenger hunt for math around the building in the morning. The second and third grade are fly flying paper airplanes and then measuring the distance and graphing it. And then the fourth and fifth grade are creating their own unit of measurement after I, there's a little story about the smoot across the Mass Ave bridge. Yeah. Um, and then creating their own un unit of measurement and then creating posters after they measure things with that. So it's, it's gonna be a fun day. Can I just add that I know that um, Ms. Francisco had 140 clipboards for the parent math morning, and she ran out of clipboards. <laughs> so they had at least 140 parents. The, the gym was packed. It was standing room only. It was phenomenal. I understand you started out with a math problem. I saw the math problem, the cookie problem. Yes. I don't know if you can remember off the top of your head, but I think, I think some pe people think that mathematics is all about multiplying, working with fractions, and that's certainly important. But there's also the whole idea of mathematical thinking. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand from the principal, there was a lot of startled faces when he presented this problem to them to work on. People weren't very happy. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't throw anything. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't throw anything. Well, was it too difficult a problem? Is that what? Uh... Um, no, it, it just required a little bit of thinking. It was, um, I th I'll try to remember it. There were 20 cookies. Mm -hmm. um, the first one had nothing on it. The, every second one had icing on it. Every third one had a cherry on it. And every fourth one had a chocolate chip on it. So the question was, which one has, or which ones have everything? And which ones have nothing? Bless you. That's cool. I mean, can we? Yes. rent you out for our homework sessions with our children. <laughs> I was having such time this week with my fourth grader. Oh my goodness, writing math sentences? Yeah. I didn't do that. So no. it was amazing. <laughs> and uh, the, the whole like tape uh, yep. thing. And um, I guess my question is, <laughs> how, <laughs> how, can we, how can we as parents um, educate ourselves a little bit more on these new uh, formalities and, yeah. me and methodologies and the other and the follow-up question I have on that was the worksheet that I was looking at it I think I want to say it said New York State on the on the yeah. top left and I wanted to find out why New York is is coming into as a, as a Red Sox fan I wanted to find out why, <laughs> why we're using New York math well as a Yankee fan uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go that's why sorry about that 
Yeah. Um, so I'll start with the, the New York Engage. And this is so, I always think it's so interesting. Um, if you talk to any teacher in New York right now, I grew up in New York, so I have a lot of teacher friends. It's like riots about the Common Core State Standards. They feel as though it's being uh, really, really pushed on them. They don't really care for the changes. Um, but the, the aside is some of the curriculum work they've done with the New York Engage is actually pretty phenomenal. It's, it's much better than a lot of the things that we've seen. So in, in terms of using that as a resource and a supplement, they actually have pretty good quality, r really good quality stuff. So that's been something that we've tapped into as a resource, uh, just because we do have to make modifications to what we're doing. Even though we have something as a backbone, you want to make modifications. Um, in terms of supporting the parents, um, that is something I would say uh, across the US that's, that's really tough right now. Because of the fact that and I think Dr. Bode just said it really well. We were always taught procedural mathematics. We were always taught, um, you know, the, the kind of a mechanisms for if you see a kind of problem, you work on it. And the reality is, in terms of transfer of knowledge, in terms of growing, um, those kind of that that kind of frame is a little antiquated. We really have to do we have to do more work in terms of creating reasoners, uh, in terms of mathematical thinkers, uh, kids who can take uh, more of that conceptual understanding and use that as the underpinnings to the procedural knowledge. And a lot of the times when you do see things with the tape, and you do see things uh, that might seem a little bit out there, really it's trying to create a physical construct of some of the concepts that we're trying to get to. So I'll, I'll give you one quick example. If I gave you two plus three equals five, just as a sentence, all of you guys can draw me a picture, you can tell me a story. You can give me four or five different ways in which you can rationalize why that sentence is true. It, it would make sense. Draw me a number line and show things. But then if I gave you the problem one half divided by two thirds equals three fourths, my feeling is that most of you guys would tell me the process why that works. You wouldn't tell me the reason why it works. And to me, that's the core of what is, is starting to change. I, I mean, all you guys are gonna, oh, oh, I, I would imagine just, I don't want to put words in uh, everyone's you've mouth. Got several licensed mathematics. I know. <laughs> I, I agree, but, but so, do you know the answer? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Well, good. <laughs> do it. Sam. That's good. Well, I could draw it. I, you could draw it? <laughs> yeah. I, you would I draw it. Pretty much, I would approach it from an area of perspective. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. So in terms of starting to develop that deeper understanding, that's kind of what we're going for. Because we don't want this to be just a simple process that at some point is forgotten, is um, close to confused with another process. So you know, if, if all we're doing is teaching procedures, then the addition of fractions at some point will be confused with solving a proportion. And then all of a sudden, you create these things that kids can't decipher to, and discern the symbolism because it really wasn't embedded in anything uh, um, substantial, uh, and that's dangerous. That's real dangerous. My only concern is the tradition of uh, chronological age mm. with certain concepts, multiplication, eight years old, or something like that. Yeah. Not all eight-year-olds eight year can understand the associative property of two times three is the same as three times two. Yeah. And uh, it's the, part of this is developmental. Is this taken into consideration? Yeah, the one thing I really do like about the, the new standards is I think there actually is a little bit more uh, of an attention paid to that. Um, I, I might be in the minority in saying that, but, uh, you know, and I say this from experience also. I, I've seen a high school student be given the problem x plus y equals 12, um, and x minus y equals 1. Or let me actually make it x plus y equals 13. Um, x minus y is 1. And high school students might struggle with that. But I have seen, because I've given, like second graders, mm -hmm. triangle plus square equals 13. Triangle minus square equals one. Can you reason what triangle and square have to be? So it's, it's, it's tough because I know that that is embedded in a lot of the kids and somewhere along the way, we stop valuing that reasoning based approach. We stop valuing that um, looking at it uh, as a puzzle creating that puzzle as disposition and start to create something where it's, it's process, uh, product oriented. Mm -hmm. And you really need to know that one way to get there. Um, and, uh, that, that's, I do think the kids can cognitively do what we ask. It depends on how we frame it. It depends on how we kind of underpin those ideas and, and build from it. Matt, as we talk about helping parents, can we talk about explain everything and how we're gonna try to use that? Oh, yeah. Um, so, we are going one-to-one -one, uh, in, in Thompson, definitely. One of the nice byproducts of that is that 
there are videos now being created. Like there is a large library of what teachers are doing in terms of lessons and terms out there. So one of the plans and one of the things that we'd like to do is to start to put these on a website and start to attach these. It, it takes a while because it takes a while to create all this digital content, but we're making it. So we want to package it as something that's going to be helpful for the community to, to use, consume, and to watch. Just so we can start to, in my opinion, convey really what happens in the classroom. At the Hardy Day on Monday, it was awesome because part of it was parents got to go in the classroom. With this, parents are going to be able to get inside the classroom in a sense much more often, much, much more often, um, which we do like, which I, do, which I think is going to be helpful and beneficial. Well, it seems like we're just about at our time. I really, really appreciate you both coming, uh, all three of you guys coming here tonight to help explain it to a guy who went into law to avoid all this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, when, when we met at the AEF fundraiser, I think it was in the fall, Matt, yeah. and, and you had you'd mentioned that you wanted to come present to the school committee. Yeah. I'm just so grateful that you guys could come tonight and, and, and do this for us, and happy Pi Day tomorrow. Yeah, thanks Enjoy. for having us. <laughs> Thank Appreciate you so it. much. And, and Matt, yeah. I grew up in New York. Yep. I'm a Red Sox fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nobody's perfect. <laughs> Nice. Yes. Fan from New York? Really? Yeah, I grew up hating the Yankees by nature. I grew up a Mets fan. So when oh. I so when oh. I so when I got here, it was easy. a Mets fan easy is transition. happy. A Mets fan. A Mets fan. No, seriously. Right. A Dodgers fan. A Dodgers, yeah. A, a Mets a, a Mets fan is happy when the Mets win and the Yankees lose. Yes. So I move here and a good day is when the Red Sox win and the Yankees lose. I, it's almost the same. It's like you're you create a math problem around. Right? Most Yankee fans still view the Mets as an expansion team. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, moving on. We are at uh, seven fifteen. We're vote vote to approve. Doctor, uh, what? Okay. Oh, you got? It? Okay, motion. Can we have a motion for Mr. Hainer? Move to appro approve the hiring of Allison Elmer as our new special education di director conditioned on the signing of the contract. Second. Any discussion on that? Dr. Bodie, committee members? Do we have the updated? Wait a minute, what was that? Um, it was for this conditional. contract. Mm -hmm. It's a conditional motion, so. Okay. Any further discussion on that? Nope. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Six. Oh. Moving on. Shall we get to calendar? Let's go to calendar. To the calendar. Many are waiting for this. Really yeah, already? Already. Yes. We will have the final final calendar for all of next year, which includes um, early release date conferences. Mm -hmm. We will bring that to you for a vote in May. It's not the first. If not the first meeting, certainly by the second. In case there's any changes that need to be made, we would have time to make them. Any possibility for April, or is that just way too early? Well, I, I, we can certainly think about it, but the, we're, we're working with teachers right now. In fact, this afternoon we had a meeting. We're trying to think out of the box a little bit more about how to do conferences at, at the different levels. Um, as you Maybe where we did a parent survey and we've mm -hmm. done teacher surveys on conferences and their level of their level of um, satisfaction with it and in gen and I would say across the board parents for the very for the most part are very satisfied but there are ways that we think that we could improve this and so I, I think it depends on how fast we can move with that I, when I talked with the group today I did tell them we were aiming for a May vote. Because I think people want to be able to put this on their calendar and know where they were it's going to be. And if you recall, just a few years ago on the calendar, we would say to be determined for conferences, and that's just not helpful. So we want to have this um, locked down mm -hmm. before the end of the year. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there are things that we can vote on and it would be very helpful for people planning uh, next year. And, the, and that's what this particular draft is. And let me talk about the uh, highlights of this draft. First of all, in August, um, again this year, we're going to have teachers begin before Labor Day. And they will be coming on the 27th and 28th. And then we'll have
have Friday off and we'll have Labor Day. So, as we did last year, the first day for all students, well, except for kindergarten, for all students will be that Tuesday after Labor Day, which is September 2nd. This is very early this year, mm -hmm. which, is, which is great. Um, as far as kindergarten goes, we will not be beginning kindergarten until the following Monday. During those days, that first week, there, there will be um, cleaning sessions and visits to the school, and, and all kindergarten parents will be given that information. But in terms of kindergarten first day, it will be the 8th. Now, I don't want to put caveats in this al already, but sh should there be some reason we didn't have school one of those days, that first week of school, we probably would have to slide that because we're basing meeting the four days for the, for the screening. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have not put- I don't think the snow is continuing to <laughs> <the> September. <laughs> I hope not, no. I hope not. I will get the snow later. <laughs> <laughs> so when we look at September, you know, of course, it will always put the uh, school committee, we ask for the school committee meetings, it will, again, the second and fourth Thursdays of the month, and that's throughout the entire calendar. Um, if you look at the 25th of September, we have uh, Rosh Hashanah. Mm -hmm. Yom Kippur this year is on a Saturday. So we have that labeled there as a no school day. When we move into October, um, we have, of course, Columbus Day, which is going to be the 13th of October. Going into November, our professional day, our all day professional day, no students, in school is going to be election day, which is November 4th. Mm -hmm. We do that for security reasons when we have big elections. So basically every two years we'll be having a professional day then. Um, as in past years, we go up to the Thanksgiving holidays and um, this year Thanksgiving is fairly late, the 27th of November. When we move into December, this is where we've had some discussion um, because this year, when we look at um, where the where Christmas falls, which is the 25th, we would we will be in school the 22nd and the 23rd. And there was actually a fair amount of discussion both with teachers, uh, with the AEA, and also with administrators. And after. Some discussion, even though there was some thought initially for closing the two weeks, because when we had the two weeks this year, it was by a fluke. It was terrific. On the other hand, we thought in the best interest of students that, that this arrangement would be better. As we move forward, um, we'll be coming back to school um, on the 5th of January. And then there is one more holiday, well, which is Martin Luther King in January. And then basically, the February and the April breaks are as they always are, the third full week of the month. Um, and so the, the February uh, break will begin, well, it's the week of the um, 16th of February. And it's at March vacation. Mar uh, in March, um, we do not have anything, any holidays, that's always the month that uh, is a long month from that point of view. And then in April, we have, again, the fourth full month. And if you notice that, the first week is actually starts on a Wednesday, but then that doesn't count. And that's something that always gets confusing to people. It's the third full week of a month, oh. okay? And then as we move um, onward here, um, Memorial Day is on the 25th of May. And then as you, now jump down to June, you'll see that our last day of school is the 17th of June. And wouldn't that be wonderful? Oh, my goodness. Don't play with it. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Just a reality. Children. So, we, we, now this is, this is important for parents to understand. We are obliged by regulation to put five snow days on our calendar. And for teachers, they know that they shouldn't be really scheduling anything because we could go that long. Um, and the same thing goes with respect to camp, really. And everybody crosses their fingers, I know, and probably schedules camp that last week of June with the hope that that will, will work out. And I hope that it works out. 
because we, we um, beyond those five days, we, re we only have a cushion of three days before we hit to the next fiscal year. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that would never be the case, and hopefully it won't be the case this year either. We're doing well. Mm -hmm. So these are, the ma these are the major holidays and start dates that they think the uh, uh, parents want to know. Mr. Hader. Not related to the, the parents and the children, but I'd like to just bring to the notice of the committee Five of these months only have one school committee uh, scheduled. Mm -hmm. So right. perhaps so we may want to look at the, at the calendar mm -hmm. a little bit different for next year. There's five whole months that they only have one school. Usually just you know, not this many. Oh, I, I understand. Special and move, move more. Yeah. That's good suggestion to start. Um, I was wondering how um, <laughs> conference, if we have uh, several half days for conferences, how does that affect the day count? Conferences wouldn't, co wouldn't affect the day count. Okay, and we never have a full day off for conferences. Well, then it would affect the day count. Okay, and it would push us out of push us out a day in June. Okay. Ms. Hart. Um, I just wanted to point out to the committee members, Aid, um, Al Fatir, and Al Atta both occur in July, both in 2014 and 2015. Mm -hmm. So, just there's no conflict with their calendars, just because we have had parents come before us in the past and ask about that. Mm -hmm. okay. May I have one other comment? Um, in our contract for teachers, we have 183 days, so we do have to be mindful of those days as well when we're thinking about this. Mm -hmm. But we, we already have, they already have 182, right? Because they have those two that are already there. 183. Right, because they have professional, professional days. Oh, and the professional yeah. days, 183, right. So can we possibly uh, get a motion on the table? So Ms. Hart? What are we I'm moving to? Um, <laughs> adopt the calendar, the draft calendar for the Arlington Public Schools 2014 to 2015. So far. For start and end date as noted. I will second it for discussion. Okay, discussion. Mr. Hare. I'd ask the superintendent just for clarification. We're basically approving the start and end days and the, uh, I assume the curriculum days and the parent conference days. You said you're gonna be, be bringing us a final draft and, we will, yeah. and that will be the final vote on the calendar at that yeah. time. There's I just wanted to clarify that. There's two other things that we wanna put in the calendar, conference days mm -hmm. and oh, early right. release days for professional development. Thank you. Any other discussion on it? Just, Allison, just for clarification. I, yeah, think I'm Mr. Hainer misspoke. So yes, we are not approving conference days. Thank They're you. not on this right. calendar. Thank okay. You. No. Ms. Hart. Um, but we are approving the no school day. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So anything that we add will only be half days. Mm. Yes. Possibly. I Unless think. we do a full day conference day. Yes, we can. We just push it out a day. So we, we the the teachers have two well, days. Then we have to pay teachers yeah, for that day. Right, right, right. Day. Okay. Being well, I'm right. saying, it's, we have to start thinking about it. I'm sorry. We don't have enough days for parents mm -hmm. to come in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we're, we're actually really thinking some creative ideas on this. Um, and we'll come back to you on that. I, I'm not sure if you, met, you may have missed one of the no school days that's listed on the calendar, the Good Friday? Oh, I mean, no, did you mention it's here. No, it's the, yeah. did you mention it? I didn't say it. Okay, I know it's there, but It's yeah. on the 3rd of April. Okay. Any further discussion on this vote? Okay, all those in favor of uh, approval of this draft school calendar for next year, say aye. 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 All those against? Okay, that carries 6-0. This will be made available now to the uh, parents and mm -hmm. community. We'll put it up on the website right away. Okay. Okay. Dr. Allison Ampey has a question. Can I, well, I just wanted to bring up something that I've heard from at least one parent about the half days, the, the early release days for professional development, that this year, because of the scheduling tending to take place on Tuesday or whatever day it is, their child has missed probably two or three months of the special that they have that falls on that day. And I think we had brought this up in the past and we were told there was gonna be some shifting of schedules and things and it doesn't sound at least at this school it's happened, but if there's a way of making them bounce around or, or do, this is, mm -hmm. it's a 
concern to this parent that the child's missing this many of their specials and um, if there's a way to make that not happen going forward, I think I would like to hear about that. I, I believe that we have one right on that depends on, but I believe that this, there was some work at, at each school in terms of how that was going not happen. So maybe later on you could tell me which school and I can take a look at that. Yeah. Because uh, there was actually a lot of discussion. Mm -hmm. The elementary principals had brought this exact issue and um, there were a number of ways that solution and people tried to find the way that's going to be the least disruptive. Sure. I don't, I don't know. Did you want to say anything about? Well, well we, we, we saw. Oh. <laughs> this is Principal uh, Stephanie Zirkikoff, Principal of Brackett School. The way we handle the schedule is we'll go alternate. We have uh, alternating um, one, one early release. Group A will have the specials, mm -hmm. and then the next early release group B will have the specials. Okay. So um, there are a couple of grades that always get them because they fit right in the middle of the mm -hmm. day, but that's how we've been working on it. And there's also thought you could shorten them, but mm -hmm. we talked to the specialists, and they, our specialists wanted the whole period mm -hmm. once a month to miss, oh, rather than missing twice a month. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was the feedback they had from the specialists, that they did, that was one of the first plans, in fact, was to shorten up the day, like they do at the high school and the middle school, the shortened periods, but that wasn't their preference. Okay. Great. All right, moving on then. Um, we are at monthly financial reports. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Um, as you know from your packets, um, Special ed costs have not gone down, but in fact have gone up. And when I did the analysis this month, I was very concerned. And in my letter to you, I targeted some areas where I had observed that costs were rising. And so I went to the special ed department, and I'd like to take a moment to thank the tremendous cooperation and hard work the special ed department did to try to educate me on some of the causes behind what's going on. The good news is that we have reserves sufficient to cover this overage for this year. The not so good news is that many of these things are trends that we need to be concerned about as we go forward. They, they represent some seismic shifts in some of the things that special ed is dealing with. One of, the, one of the things that we're seeing is that in 2008, um, ultra low birth weight babies below three pounds began surviving in much higher numbers. And these children um, have a very high incidence of disabilities of various kinds, particularly in vision and hearing. And they're now hitting kindergarten age. And you know, now that those babies are surviving r more routinely, that's not going to end. And so our expectation is that while vision and hearing services have escalated this year, that that's not likely to reverse itself into the future. So one of the things that we're looking into is the possibility of hiring um, uh, an in-district person with the vision specialties that we're now currently contracting out for, thinking that that might be more cost effective if we can hire someone on staff, perhaps sharing them with another district, perhaps having them to ourselves if the, the workflow warrants, and of course contingent on finding somebody with the right specialties to do this. But you know, outsourcing these kind of specialty services when you have a student or two is cost effective, but when you start reaching volumes, it becomes cost ineffective, and that's what's crossing over with vision services right now. So that wasn't anticipated, but it is something that, that's not a blip, that this is going to be forward moving. In terms of the out-of-district tuition, we looked at the new out-of-district placements for this year, and close to 50% of them are rela directly related to hospitalizations of students and their return from hospitalizations and the implications of that. And so there's more work we have to do with this. Again, it used to be something that was relatively rare it is now an escalating problem. And it's not just in Arlington. This is statewide. This is nationwide. And we need to be thinking about ways to contend with this. Um, and we discussed a, a great number of things, but I think the most important thing to do is to be um, <laughs> looking, at, um, looking at this from a budgetary perspective to expect that we're going to see some pressure in this area. Transportation obviously goes hand in hand with out of district placements. The more you place out of district, the more you have to transport them. And uh, ABA services are also related, as you've heard many times, 
general anxiety, stress, social emotional behavioral issues are believed to be on the rise generally and ABA services are one of the ways that we can specifically approach um, providing support to these students and their families to hopefully keep them in school, keep them functioning in school, enable their access to the curriculum, which is the point. So it was, um, on the one hand, very dismaying. On the other hand, very enlightening to speak to all of the special ed administrators and to hear their thoughts on these subjects and to really try to think about what we can do going forward. As I say, we have reserves sufficient this year. That's why we built up those reserves because generally speaking, special ed does run in cycles. It's, it's raining or it dries out and, and it's really raining this year and hopefully it will dry out a bit next year. But it's important to be aware that we need to be thinking about budgeting and long-term strategies for these areas that are emerging. And hopefully, you know, as the new special ed director comes on board, we can be looking at things that seem to be less pressing. And perhaps there's areas where we can pull back since we have to extend in different areas. I mean, it's always a movable feast. I'm, I'm very grateful we have the reserves to contend with this year. Mm -hmm. Question? Can I answer that? One of the areas that we are going to give a lot of thought to is that the, we have a number of students coming back from hospitalizations is looking at um, our program in the high school, because they tend to primarily be at the secondary level, th though they're not exclusively so, I believe. Um, and that is actually one of the programs that um, uh, Ms. Elmer began at Reading High School, it was a therapeutic program. And so that was something that we were looking at very carefully um, as to how we would do that next year and we'll come back to you should we make some progress along those lines. But we, we also realized to some extent there's a little bit of a zero sum going on here because um, we already have a, a proposed budget and we're gonna have to think about you know, other, other ways that we might be able to potentially uh, fund another position should we need to do that. As far as vision services, we already are spending the money. It's, it's in contracted services and so it'll be a, a really just sort of a shifting of that, of those kind of those monies. But again, we don't know whether we'd be able to find someone with that, that level of expertise. Um, but on the other hand, we haven't started to look either. Mr. Hayter. Uh, I defer to the superintendent on this. Is it appropriate at this time to discuss uh, the legal costs and things? It's associated with the subject, I would think okay. so. The, I'd like to bring to the committee's attention uh, from the documents that I've received from Stoma Channel and Miller, we have exceeded our retainer $60,000 limit by $15,000 by the end of January. We still have five months more to go. Um, I guess I would ask uh, Ms. Johnson, will that be reporting out? Because according to our contract, once we exceed the $60,000, they'll be billing us on an hourly rate. And normally you don't put it on here because it's covered under the retainer, and I understand that. So I don't know how it's gonna be reported to us. My understanding is that we put all the bills we pay onto this spreadsheet. Right, but normally under the retainer column, the only thing that shows up on, the, on this piece here is the two, the 20,000 the 20,000, because it's covered, but our contracts are at the $60,000. Our contract with Stoma Chandler and Miller says we're paying at the hourly rate of $190. So I guess what I'd be asking you uh, for it instead of, it's, it needs to be brought out in this column. Well, would it not be non-retainer legal fees at that point? I don't know. I mean, it I mean it, it, the it, logic it, of it to me would be that you, we pay the full retainer amount and then anything in excess of that is non-retainer fees. Well, which would be they're, the other they're, providing, they're providing us with a spreadsheet of, of mm -hmm. uh, retainer, non-retainer. And that's how I was able to break this down and see that additional 75,000. I think it's important. They're gonna still give it to us. Uh, I guess I'm the only one right now that being aware of it. Uh, well, you're, you, I think your question goes to, this is a public document. Yes. So you want the public to be able to see those breakdowns as well. So maybe right. what we're getting from the law firm could be made uh, pu public on the right. website or. And my only other issue with, with them, and, and I've shared it, the spreadsheet is dealing with specific billable hours. They have other fees on it that are showing up on our uh, warrant article. And I, I got real nervous because what I received on the sheet, it said, I'm rounding the numbers off, $3,200, and the billing on the uh, warrant article was $4,000. There was an additional fee 
that didn't show up on the other. That's not an issue here, but I guess it's important for everyone to see mm -hmm. this difference and this breakdown. And uh, they are providing us with a breakdown of retainer fees on a monthly basis, separate from that. So, and the issue of going over that that retainer thing is something I think the committee has to look into itself. Uh, because we still have five months to go on that. Dr. Yeah, I think to tag on to what Mr. Hainer said, um, I think it would be helpful to separate out, not, not just lump the stuff that we're being billed hourly in, that's in excess of retainer into other non-retainer fees. It, we need to keep these separate because we're going to come to a decision of whether to continue this, this um, this contract in in a few years and we need to know how much we're going over and is it because the retainer stuff is going over or is it because the other um, and uh, it, it doesn't seem too hard to put in another column or something that's you know retainer excess I'm sorry to be dim but I'm not entirely understanding, and rather than drag everybody through and what I understand could be a torturous discussion of ways and means, could, could we, I, I'll be happy could we to have a down. subcommittee yeah. or something to sit down and figure out exactly how you want to see the spreadsheet? Okay. This spreadsheet actually precedes me, so I am happy to give you whatever you'd like to see. Okay. Fine. One second. This legal spreadsheet? You yeah, it precedes okay. yeah. me. Yeah, I just maintained it when I came here. Ms. Heim? Um, I would just ask where Stoneham Chancellor and Miller does a lot of our special education mm -hmm. cases, and... Um, Therefore, for somebody that might be more knowledgeable, there might be a direct correlation between certain IEP challenges and how much it's costing the town, that, that we make sure that that is never apparent in whatever goes out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, and so it's above so, retainer, so you don't instance, want to say what it is. It's just a bottom number. Right, but, but the thing is, I mean, the, the unfortunate piece is because they're just doing our special for the most part, just doing our special education, mm -hmm. when these amounts go out, this is tied to the IEP process. And I do not want to see this presented in a way that um, in any way, shape, or form could be perceived as reflecting negatively on children that are receiving those services or families that are advocating for their children. And I will not be around, as many of you know, to be on, to be part of this in the future. But I just want to put that out there right now <coughs> as an area that I see could be um, could could be opened. Ms. Starks, um, I want to say that um, in my classroom in Lexington, I do I have a, a he's legally blind student, um, so I know that we have and I have met with uh, we have two very good vision people who have met with our team um, because I guess he can see enough to do things but he's legally blind um, and that also our school has been uh, outfitted with um, the speakers in a lot of the rooms and I know Thompson has that right a lot of the teachers already use it there for the hearing impaired but I know that at our middle school we also have that um, so um, if you're looking for expertise, I know that there is some in Lexington. Um, cause, and although he's the first, I've heard that we already have one or two more next year. So I think that you're right. It's kind of, you're, it's we're seeing a lot more of it. And um, you know, it, it is interesting. He does very well. He has an iPad that he carries around. He takes pictures of everything because then on the iPad he can get it to whatever size he wants so he can see it. So it's- well, One of the things that I didn't understand about this until you know, I had the opportunity to learn more, was that somebody who's totally blind, there's a set of adaptations. Yeah. But for people that have limited sight, you know, maybe they see partially in the field or, you know, that, that everybody has a slightly different visual disability, and so right. the adaptations have to be different on a child-by-child -child basis. I yeah. had no idea. Yeah. I mean, it's enormously complex. Yeah, You know, yeah. that your student has the ability with technology and perhaps yes. technology in some places or how a room is arranged or how the teacher yes. stands and it's just enormously complex and challenging given that it's variable in terms of the disability. Right. Okay, Mr. Hanna. In no way do I mean to, to, to disparage anything that's previously been said, but we have a fiduciary responsibility. We have a contract with our uh, a legal firm and part of that was to, the idea is to have a retainer. 
and the idea of a retainer is to contain costs, we have exceeded that retainer by a uh, uh, percentage already, and we not even just the, over the halfway. That's the part I'm concerned with. We all Stoneman Chandler and Millet does a lot of us, but does our special ed, and that is a piece of it. But they also do school law, and that's a big part of it, which would be covered under the retainer too. So the the facts that 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 would be presented on this sheet, in no way identify one way or another. It's a it's a bottom line number. And that's all I'm asking for is a reporting of a bottom line number. Yes, hi, real quick. Um, I am no way saying that we should not follow our fiduciary responsibilities. I am saying that when we are posting something that can be can be interpreted as somebody knows the right facts to point to a specific child, perhaps uh, the Arlington Public Schools website is not the best place for that to be posted. Perhaps there are confidential documents that a subcommittee would be looking at when making that determination that would not in any way, shape, or form mitigate somebody's right to privacy or adequate and free, free public education. And I just want to be mindful of that. It's about the kids. Dr. Allison, <coughs> Anthony? Um, I'm on a different topic. I just, can you explain what ADA means when you're talking about ADA services? A ABA? ABA. I, so I didn't even hear it Let right. Let me check my notes. Um, well, I thought it was America that, with that's Disabilities not what she was Act. No, that's, that's <coughs> ABA. Oh, it's ABA. ABA. Yeah. It is behavioral services? Yes, it's a specific type of behavioral services. Okay. It's um, a behavior analysis, a person who's capable of looking at a student's behavior and helping to, uh, to create a behavior plan for that student to help okay. the teacher and the student in the classroom. Okay. Or at home. Or, yeah, or at home. Any other questions on this before we, Mr. Schlicken? Yeah, I just want to say on the special ed legal budget, you know, I also have to look at that, upon this as, a, as an indicator in how well we're doing in terms of maintaining our relationships with our families. And if this number is going up, it indicate, I, I think it's sort of like a, like a fever uh, on one level, in that if, if our expenses are going up or getting extraordinary, we may be getting into too much of an adversarial posture as a district, and I hope that we are, with the new special ed director coming in, we can start to mitigate that as well. Yeah, I just want to follow up on Mr. Schlickman's comment. I, too, am concerned about um, how we are with our relationships with, with our parents um, and, and what effect, what cause and effect have, have you found from, from that question, uh, Ms. Johnson, from speaking with the special ed coordinator? Um, and, and what, if, if there is some cause and effect, what can we do about studying what, what, is, what is happening in our district? A professional industry has grown up where parents pay people to get better and more expensive services for their children. And so that, you know, if you just want to look at it as relationships between the school and the parent, the role of the advocate can't be ignored in all of this. And so I think the contention that rising out of district costs reflect poorer relationships with the parents is not accurate. I, I, think, I think that, it, you know, as with anything in SPED, it depends on a case-by-case -case basis. It also depends on the advocate they may or may not hire and how that advocate may or may not conduct themselves. There's a lot of factors. It's extremely complex. And we're at, we're at our time for this item, so I don't, I don't want to cut any other members off, but is there a possibility that we can revisit this, this issue at a future meeting? Because, it, you know, the, the amount that we're over what was projected is significant. It is. But also our special education costs are significantly over what was projected. Mm -hmm. We're about $1.2 million. If, if, um, it's significant, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Diane explained quite well where the, the places are, that there was no way to necessarily predict some of this. And, um, and as you recall, the, and there's a strong correlation between increasing special education costs and legal costs, because sometimes cases can be very complex. Mm -hmm. And I certainly don't want to, at, a, at this table, discuss uh, any of those or even allude to any of them. But <coughs> if you recall the charts that we have done on historicals in special education, 
the one thing that you can say is that there, there is no pattern. It just go, it's just like this. And all you can do is look at long-term trends in terms of what the cost will be and try to protect yourself from when you have a, a particularly high year, which we do. We have a stabilization account. Unfortunately, we're probably going to have to use that money this year to be able to, to um, um, fund these increases. But some things are just not pre predictable. Um, and in fact, I remember uh, when we were f first think talking about stabilization accounts, uh, Diane was saying that she would like to see a $1 million, uh, remember that? Mm -hmm. We were talking about that, and we would have probably liked to have it, and I, I certainly would be like to have it in this particular time frame. But this is, this is something that is the way it is in special education because you don't know what what problems are going to present themselves in any given year. Our long-term trend is that if you look over a 10-year period, it's going to mimic somewhere over 7%. 7% is a reasonable number, but I would say, though, that we probably are over that number, and what happens is that that differential is made up in the operating budget. But that's that's really about the best you can do in a given, you know, you're going forward. And that's what we're doing, and the, and the plan with the town is to do exactly that. Mr. Hanna, could we please have a, a, a report without specificity of um, legal costs under special ed, uh, out of district programs, bottom line numbers, not, not individual, and uh, the added, the additional costs we've had just in this fiscal year? Just to look at that, please. Okay, but in the absence of case-by-case -case information, it doesn't tell you a lot. I mean, I'm happy well, to give that to you. Yeah. And that's the, that's the difficulty in doing analysis in this area. It is so case-dependent and so difficult to discuss. I mean, right now we're at about $7 million, give or take. I'm oh. sorry, $7 million, give or take, in out-of-district tuition. That's where we stand. And right. I say give and take because we have kids possibly going into 45-day placements and possibly returning. And so it is constantly then, in flux. Then the follow-up question, I'd, I'd, once I got those figures, I'd, I'd ask how much of this is a result of litigation? As a result of litigation? Yes. So district precipitated by litigation on the part of the parents? Litigation. I, uh, yeah, well, but I, no, I, I don't think we're going to litigate to, to pay for someone to go out of district. So the answer to that would be yay. I can't think of, and I've reviewed all of the cases, I can't think of a single case that was precipitated by litigation. I mean, there, there are cases of students in need, and then disagreement arises and around the best treatment for the need. But it doesn't start with litigation. But have we been, oh. um, no, just like those two figures, if I could please. Sure. Thank you. And, and perhaps I just want to put out there that because of the spike, because of this very, very large spike this year, that we, po we consider um, an outside group to come in and study what might be going on here to give us some aid in terms of how we roll out what we can do in district and what we have to do out of district? It is something to think about. Um, but I think we have a pretty clear understanding of what's going on. It's just it's not so easy to fix it. And I don't think a consultant can fix the problems that we can't fix. Our hands are tied in many ways by, by the state law, uh, by what's ethical, um, by what's possible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we know where the problems are. There's just not a lot we can do about it. And so the best thing we can do is plan for that, mm -hmm. is to make sure that we budget appropriately, to make sure that in better years when things break our way instead of not our way, that we build up our reserves again, mm -hmm. that we, we be as prudent as possible and we be as proactive as possible, that we strengthen our intervention models that we make sure that we get the kids that are struggling early and often and help them do better. But, you know, at the extreme end of this spectrum, at the extremely expensive end of the spectrum, we have very ill children. And more ill children live longer. More fragile children come to school than ever before. Medical technology has advanced to the point that children that would have died years ago are alive and expected to come to school. And we have to accommodate that. It is a changing world. Mr. Film? It would, it would be good <clears throat> to see if our out-of-district trend 
mirrors the out of district trends of other districts. Mm -hmm. That would be a good data point. I think that's. I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure I can get that. Yeah, data. I know. I, I was gonna, that was my follow-up, Diane. Is I'm not, I don't know how to get that no, because it's not that. something on the DESE website. Correct. Um, but you have colleagues who are. Anecdotally, you know, yes. You have colleagues who are CFOs who you network with and know, so it's possible that. Anecdotally, I would say yes. That we are all seeing, yeah. you know, the, the trend in hospitalizations, the trend in out-of-district placements, are are just a spike lately that are really pressing people, and I believe. Dr. Bodie has heard similar things from her colleagues at meetings, and Dr. Chesson as well. Well, if it's possible to call a few other districts and get that data, it wouldn't be a bad thing to do. I mean, there's people, know enough people to do it. You can call four or five districts and see what they're experiencing. The second thing in my own experience in budgeting is that whenever I told a board that we can't predict you know, certain costs and they go up and down, they said, well, then plan for up. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how my mm -hmm. yep. board has directed me over the years. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which I never like, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no. But I work for them, and, and they're great people. Um, so uh, <laughs> they are, and and so uh, they are great people. And so uh, I don't know. So I, I, so when you say when you say things go things go down, it it. But planning for up allows us when it goes down to replenish the reserves. Correct. Yeah. And that's yeah. exactly what we, yeah. we try Correct. to do. So yeah. So I mean, we have we have planned for the up. I mean, we've adjusted this year's budget upward by yeah. seven hundred thousand dollars in out of district tuition. Mm -hmm. So going into fifteen, we have increased the budget to accommodate that. Yeah. So if if things break the other way, kids come back in a district, programming shifts, reserves, mm -hmm. back in the reserves they go. Mr. Slick. Yeah, we have a legal moral obligation to to spend the money on the special needs children, mm -hmm. and and I understand that. I'm not not I'm not going after that right now. Uh, it is what it is. The thing that I'm worried about is that we're spending money on attorneys surrounded these issues. And that's the number I'd like to see come down. Now, I'm willing to suspend this conversation. In fact, I think I need to suspend this conversation until after our new special ed director comes on board and take a look at this and come to us with some sort of a conversation. But I think that it's in our best interest to see if we can't reduce legal expenditures on the special ed side uh, Somehow, because that doesn't go to kids. Dr. Allison Anthony? Um, with these new revised higher numbers for the um, how much we're going to go over budget this year, I understand we have reserves even with the higher number mm -hmm. for this year. But is there, does this imply that we need to change anything in this budget that we were going to talk about? I do not believe so. It will leave us much less well reserved going into next year but I do not believe we need to make adjustments to this budget. Please bear in mind that we still have, we are still carrying one year of circuit breaker in reserve. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so if God forbid next year we were to get slammed again, yeah. we would still have those circuit breaker funds to fall back on, mm -hmm. leaving us in an extremely dire position for the following year, but it would at least buy us some time. Yeah. Okay. And, and looking back over 10 years, we tend not to have two consecutive bad years. You know, but past, yeah. Past performance is no guarantee of future results, so. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the update. You know. And a good segue, I think, into our next conversation, which is discussion on our FY15 budget. Mm -hmm. um, oh. I would have liked to begin, well, you, you, you had a chance to really look at this. Um, we've outlined what the budget drivers are for next year, what the budget priorities are, which are consistent with our goals and, and actually consistent with um, some of the needs we've just been talking about. So at this juncture, what we need to hear from you is if there's things that you, you would want to change um, because this is the time that we would do it. The last time we had this discussion, <coughs> weeks ago we were looking at we were talking about the reserve positions we have five built into the budget and uh, you were expressing a lot of concern about mm -hmm. you know support for administrators and I've had some conversations and I can say over the last week it's, there's no one size doesn't fit all mm -hmm. different different administrators might say they would want different types of support so you could, you could reserve one of the positions for 
a variety of supports. Um, on the other hand, should we need five positions when we get through this summer, we need five positions. And that's exactly what happened last year. So I would, I, I think that my advice would be that since it's sort of non-specific, non-person driven, to hold off on it until we see where, where things are going in terms of enrollment. And um, there are things that we can put in place depending on what happens a little bit later. For example, um, there may be a principal who might want more administrative support um, that would not be doing any evaluations but would be doing support in terms of, for example, in doing MCAS this week. I mean, that is a very time intensive process and I think Reba can probably attest to how time intensive that is. But we're also at a period of time where we're doing formative assessments and other, uh, other evaluations and that, and so all of these come together and that's actually one of the things we have to take a look at going into next year. But it may be that there'd be extra support for those types of administrative functions that, that, would, that, that would not be keeping a principal from being in the classroom. That type of support. Okay. How I'd like to handle this is, is to vote tonight the um, budget transfer Buckets, if it, if it, as it were, on uh, section four, mm -hmm. page two, mm -hmm. um, beginning with elementary total. That sounds to me like what we've historically done recently. And um, mm -hmm. may I entertain a motion um, beginning with the elementary total of thirteen million twelve thousand eight hundred thirty three. Thank you. Oh. So moved. Second. Sorry. Any discussion on the amount for the elementary total for next year? Dr. Hoffman. I realize Dr. Bodie just mentioned this, but I was hoping to hear a more firmed up proposal for how we can support our administrators. Just I'm concerned we're going into a situation where we have several schools at our elementary level that have a lot of classrooms that they're going into the evaluation, they're having to implement it, it's still new, and I'm concerned whether they're going to have time. Um, I understand, it sounds like we're going to have to wait, but I was looking forward to hearing a proposal. Well, there's, like I said, there's different, different possibilities. Several, several principals um, have said that it would be very helpful, for example, to have people who are in multiple buildings um, for example, we have people who are in art or music, um, or anyone that anyone that has multiple buildings, to have some administrative support in that respect, so that those evaluations would not be done by a building principal. Just to take a little bit, um, a little bit off of the load in that respect. So that is one possibility that we would be looking at for next year. We would have to get down to figure out how many people, what kind of FTEs that is, and, and but that's one possible proposal. Right. I, I meant that we don't have something that we, has a bottom line, and we can just say yes. We think that's you know how I, we should. I think should it's going to go so, the other uh, direction. I think it's going to be that we're going to see where we stand financially and back into it that way, uh, rather than as we do with all these other positions. We're, we're going to hire that. <laughs> that position and, and that money is allocated. I think at this juncture, um, it would be better to see where we stand and then fill in where we can and hopefully we'll be able to have a better idea of that sometime early summer. I, I don't, you either, you can take the reserve position and say that one reserve position is going to be used for administrative support and it's going to take different forms. It's going to be allocated for support I said before, either for evaluation or for administrative support in the building. I, I don't hear a plan firmed out as much as I would want to, to move money around. Yeah, so that's, that, that's all. I don't that's, have. Well, I, I'm confining it to what we've reserved for one reserve position was 55000 not to exceed that. And it would have, it would be tailored to the particular situation. So it's firm in the sense that you could use that money. But I, I think that the principles are concerned about class size mm -hmm. and they would rather wait and see 
where things fall out in terms of, of increased enrollment before we back into that. So if, at the end of the day, after we hire um, the people that we need, and there's 20,000 that's there, then we'll tailor that what, the support to that amount of money that's there. That's how we're thinking about it right now. Okay. Anything else on elementary total, Ms. Hine? No. I was just going to say I think it's prudent based on what we just heard from Ms. Johnson mm -hmm. about um, the needs of some of the students we're going to have coming into mm -hmm. kindergarten and based on last year's enrollment information where um, we saw a surge at the end of the summer of kindergartners that we did not know were going to be enrolled that we wouldn't necessarily want to commit um, in any positions at that elementary mm -hmm. level till we have more of a history of where this town is going with both of those features. Anything else? I just, dovetailing on, on our math presentation uh, a short while ago, I do want to note that there has been an increase to our math yeah. intervention at the mm -hmm. elementary mm -hmm. level of $70,000, mm -hmm. um, which I think is, 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 is what Mr. Coleman was saying, which yes. was really needed mm -hmm. uh, to augment their, their work, which is, um, the reserve positions, the five, they're within this bucket, as it were, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion on the elementary, Mr. Hainer? The different programs, the different curricular uh, aspects, current programs and future programs, is that in this part of the budget? Um, the elementary? Ele this would be any of the elementary. So I mean, if you go back to the superintendent's budget message right. and you look to the spreadsheets, right. all the changes that are listed under elementary increases or decreases would be in this bucket. Right. But I mean, I, maybe I didn't say it correctly. The programs that we currently have in place that require uh, monetary... It's sustenance. in there. It's in there. And any new programs that we're thinking about would be in this budget as well. Yes. Thank you. Well then, all those in favor of uh, the elementary total for FY15 of thirteen million twelve thousand eight hundred and thirty-three dollars, say aye. 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 All those against? Abstentions. Okay. Seven zero. Moving on to secondary total. Uh, we have a motion on the secondary total of thirteen million two hundred fifty-one thousand forty-four dollars. So moved. Second. Okay. Discussion. Just yep. Mr. Uh, the $40,000 restructuring for FY15, mm -hmm. could you just? System-wide floating clerk that has been vacant this year. Thank you. Mr. Schlicker, Mr. Hart, Dr. Unless somebody has any questions. To, to some extent, this is going to be driven, these increases, by what students select. Mm -hmm. So while there is a proposal between in terms of FTEs by department, mm -hmm. that may that may change mm -hmm. because it just depends on what students select mm -hmm. as they as they do the they they uh, register for the, the courses next year. But um, we feel pretty confident that this amount of money is going to cover the the increases that we're seeing in enrollment. When will we have the uh, course selections in, in, in hand that we can start making actual budget decisions or schedule decisions? Um, well, the, the program of studies is out, and mm -hmm. you know, you've approved it. I would say sometime in April, maybe, because I know that the department chairs in particular are very anxious mm -hmm. to be able to you know, advertise that they had mm -hmm. a position. But on the other hand, to do it right now is premature until you go through the process and you see how many sections you need of a particular course and how that all plays out in the department. So the positions that we know are due to retirement or um, are, are, are maybe not subject to sensitively to enrollment, as soon as we can, we'd like to, we're, we're going to post them. But anything that's, anything that's a function of student choice, we're going to hold off until we get that completed, which would be later this spring. So for the public, we're seeing additions to our secondary, um, as I see here in tab five, mm -hmm. of $250,500 at the Audison and $320,260 at the high school in terms of additions for next year? Um, 
doesn't add up to the nine, but yeah. sure. Uh, it's a. Uh, we may be looking at the subtotal of just the town appropriation portion without the revolving. Oh. There's an increase of 909,000, mm -hmm. oh, right. so. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so a change of 909,653. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other discussion on secondary? All those in favor of the $13,251,044 in secondary total say aye. 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 All those against? Abstentions? 7-0. Moving on to special education total. Make a motion on the special education total, please. Six hundred. I mean, seventeen million six hundred ninety-two thousand three hundred eighty-five dollars. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Hanner. Does this reflect the additional cost we've just been talking about this year? Yes, it does. If you look at the difference between the FY14 budget and the FY level service budget. Okay. That uh, that picks up teacher contract increases and the additional out of district tuition. Thank you. Anything else? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Abstentions? <coughs> Seven zero. Curriculum and instruction total. I have a motion on that of one million four hundred nine thousand four hundred twenty nine thousand five hundred thirty four dollars. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Hainer. Why are we reducing this by thirty thousand? I think it has to do with the <coughs> shifting of curriculum materials from the math department budget <coughs> where we were rolling out two grades worth of middle school math curriculum to the assistant superintendent's budget to be a more generalized curriculum budget for the entire district. So if I understand what you're saying, we're not actually reducing the curriculum budget? Just shifting it from one line to another. And why did we Moved do that? Bucket. Because we put a lot of money last year into math to roll out curriculum specifically at the math, but we don't roll out the curriculum year after year. Thank you. So the funds were going back to the assistant superintendent. Thank you. Sure. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Abstentions? 7-0. Administration total, $2,714,413. We have a motion on administration total, please. So moved. Discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those against? Abstentions? 7-0. Other total. Facilities, IT, transportation, totaling $5,824,844. May I have a motion on the other total? So moved. Second. Discussion? Mr. Hainer? Does this include our elevator? Elevator. All the issues that go with it. We, That's we building budget, maintenance. We budget maintenance for our she various mechanical talking. systems. Thank you. Any further questions, Ms. Hunt? Bill. Yeah. I do. I'm afraid to go in the elevator with my weight. Um, does this also include the need for additional transportation that you were discussing with us earlier? Yes, it does. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Abstentions? 7-0. And I'd like uh, a vote, I guess. Um, do we, we don't vote the grants, do we? No. Um, vote on the total revolving in town appropriation total of $53,925,053. May I have a motion on that? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Abstentions? 7 0. Okay, so on March 17th, we will go before Mr. Fanning and your fellow members and present this to all of you. Um, 7.45 Monday. <laughs> St. Patrick's Day, wear green. Okay. Moving on. Right on time. Huh? Superintendent's no. report. No. Dr. Fody. That you. That's quite a few things. <laughs> Just giving you a <laughs> preparation. Awesome. Can't wait for snow. Your report on snow. To the All right. Fortunately, we did not have to have a snow day today. That was Why good. We have to have a delay. So yes. I had given people, people being a, a staff and parents, the heads up that that might be a possibility. Uh, there was a concern yesterday that if it would freeze, it would be too icy. But I have to commend our custodians that are day custodians. They came in at five this morning. They were out there. Uh, making sure everything was salted as best as possible. 
DPW did a terrific job last night. They started at midnight. They, by the time I was talking to them around 4.30, quarter to 5, they had already done almost two rounds. So they did, a, they did a terrific job to make sure that the streets and the school entrances were in, in okay shape. Now, now, was it still slippery? Yes, it, it is. And on the other hand, we're living in New England, so to some extent we have to uh, adjust to that, which I, I know people are very tired of adjusting to. <laughs> um, <laughs> but soon, maybe, except I saw there's another storm coming in next week. No. Hopefully it's all rain. So we may be getting to the point where we're out of it, but you know, I don't want to say that because then it might jinx it. At the moment, we still remain just the first, the first Monday of the last week, and hopefully it doesn't go beyond that. And I said to parents last night, and it bears saying again this evening, that you know, these decisions are made very early with the best information, many, many conversations, uh, people that are on the ground outside the schools, and our DPW, and you make the best decision, but sometimes parents might look out and say, I just don't think I can drive, or I don't think it's safe for my child to walk, and those are decisions that parents need to make. And uh, it's certainly if they call the school, and they say this is the reason, it's an excused absence. It's still an absence, it's just that it's an excused absence. So hopefully I won't have to say that again for six more months, but we'll see. <laughs> One thing on yesterday, if I may, Dr. Yeah, Bodie, please. if it weren't for Kiersey and your Facebook post, <laughs> I wouldn't have known that there was a possibility for a delay this morning. For some reason, some folks, some parents didn't receive the email message from you that apparently went out about this morning possibly being a delay. I'm wondering what might have been a breakdown in that email communication. Well, I think the first thing I would have you do is go into your parent portal mm -hmm. and check your contact information. Because when we send out an alert, when we send out an email, um, that information feeds the list that is sent out. Mm -hmm. So okay. if for some reason it's, if, it go, if you go in and you find out that it is in there and it's correct and you didn't get an email, then this is something that um, I would want Leilani D'Agostino, who is a data person and also who oversees the alert now system to, to take a look at. Dr. Allison. Uh, I'm not sure that all schools, the elementary schools, have received information to get into the parent portal, at least not this year. Um, I know we did not. Okay. Ms. Heim. I would also just want to remind people just because I, I can forget about it to um, check their junk mail folders as yes. well and make sure that they have <coughs> acknowledged that mm -hmm. the Arlington Public Schools are a safe center. Mm -hmm. Yes, and okay. anybody can, you just have to go on to the Arlington Public Schools website yeah. and on the right hand side you can sign up to receive time. email from any school. All schools if you want. Yeah. You can get all of it. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Just to be safe. Yeah. Just to be safe. Thank you. That's a very good idea. I mean, you, you can. can right. Yeah, anybody. You don't have to yeah. even have a child if you just want the information. Mm -hmm. You know. That's why I do it. Great. Thank you. So you knew about the delay then? Yes. yes I did. I knew not not to come to school this morning. <laughs> <laughs> you knew not to come to school. Okay. I didn't go. All right. Um, the, the weather held off well enough last night that we were able to have the uh, parent. Present, the presentation for parents and community members at the high school last night, we had, I would say, about 100 people there for the presentation, and Lori Coles, who you had heard give her presentation on the report, um, gave a presentation last night, and there were a lot of questions. We went beyond the time. I, I sort of expected that might happen, but they were very good questions, and uh, I, I want to thank her. I think she did a terrific job on this report, really laying out what some of the key issues are. And that report is on our website. If you go on the district website, there on the right-hand side, you'll see AHS facilities documents. Anytime we have uh, relevant documents um, related to this, the, the, um, the condition of the building and what we're doing to plan for it will be, will be posted there. And uh, in fact, we've got to get the uh, PowerPoint up there from, um, from yesterday. So we're going to put that up as well. 
I have very good news, though I'm sure you probably already know this, that when we presented on, s on Monday evening, the Board of Selectmen voted 5-0 to support submissions of the SOIs, which is terrific. They have to do a, f a formal vote on the 24th uh, using the language that you voted on the, the last week, and we've sent that language over to them, and they'll have the formal language to submit. So the motion that you passed last week should be fine. Um, there were only two things you were, we were considering we might have to amend it, and one was the date, and we had the 26th. That should be fine. Um, and then the second w issue was whether we could, we could uh, file under the first priority, and as I think people since that may people have been listening to the discussion, I, I want to have Diane talk a little bit about what she had heard from MSBA with regard to the first priority. I, uh, I spoke to Diane Sullivan at the MSBA uh, the next morning after our last meeting, and she was very clear that priority one needs to be an imminent, safe, imminent danger of health and safety from the building itself, that as best as falling in roofs, unsafe conditions, and you need a third party expert to certify that. So it's not enough for us to say the building's oh. a menace, you have to have a professional say that the building is a menace. So that's a very limited use priority. So I think that's something that's used when, a couple years ago with the heavy snow packs and roofs went, went down in Western Massachusetts, that's what they're looking for, for a priority one. Okay. The, Mr. Hanner. the Estabrook School in Lexington came in under that because they found PCBs under yeah. the building itself that were migrating up into the classrooms and stuff. And they got, they were fortunate, three years from start to finish, they got put, because of the danger right. itself. Well, we, and I'm grateful we have no such danger yes, here. At I agree. Yes. <laughs> now on, this, on this topic, one of the concerns I had from last meeting was that in addition to the SOI that we voted, uh, the MSBA gets the minutes of our meeting mm -hmm. of March 6th. So maybe we can, um, well, we're not meeting until, is this, is this getting submitted on the 26th? Well, we'd have to amend that vote tonight if it wasn't. Why would we amend it? You, you have concern. it in the minutes. Yeah. What's your concern? What I'm saying is what are you worried they're not about? approved minutes is what oh. I think he's saying. Right. <coughs> Does it have to, have to be approved? Or? Oh, do the minutes have to be Does approved? It's approved or drafted. Oh. It's just oh, say oh. minutes. I don't know. I, don't I know think what the, the minutes have to be approved. They do have to be approved. I think they do have to but be approved. But does it go with the SOI at the same time? I think we submitted that after. Um, we have to submit this, we have to certify by checking a box when we submit electronically, but then we have to provide the copies along with the signature page when we send the hard copy in. So we could vote them on the 27th, the, the minutes, and just send it, because we're going to send the hard copy. We submit electronically, and then we have a package that goes to them as well. So we don't submit the minutes electronically? Just the No, I check a box on their form saying that the it's been voted by your governing body. Mm -hmm. there, there's yeah, a the form that you sign um, mm -hmm. will go electronically as well, I think. We'll no, no, the we'll form is that, hard copy. We'll just send that hard but copy, okay. If we check a box that says we've done it and we're not doing it until you the next day. You did vote it. We did it. We've you already voted, voted it. it. No, we haven't voted the minutes. What are you checking? If Do you check a box to say that we've voted the minutes? No. 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 You say I check that we've voted the minutes. I'm reading what you gave us, and it just says, for documentation of the vote of the school committee, minutes of the school committee meeting at which the vote was taken must be submitted with the original signature of the committee chairperson. It does not say approved minutes, so okay. I think we're good. Great. Any other but, discussion? Uh, Dr. Do we need to authorize you to sign anything, or can you just do it? Do we need to vote to authorize you to sign on our behalf? Sign. It's fine. No, I think that because we you voted it, it? Okay. I have that authority. We're good. Not until late night. <laughs> My last act has changed. There was um, a, a lot of interest last night, as, as you know, um, from other conversations you've had with people in tours. We are offering three tours um, in the next week for people who would like to see firsthand the, the high school. The first tour is this Saturday from 9 to 10.30. So you, you actually come at 9 because it's going to take us an hour and a half to do the tour. Um, we have a registration link which has been on our website. Um, and in fact, uh, the link didn't 
we put the new link out to all parents. We've also put the link in the, the February newsletter. It wasn't initially in there working. So that's been done. So there are ways of doing that. But if all, all um, fails, you can always call my office or you could call the high school office just to let them know that you would like to come. So it's this Saturday from 9 to 1030. And we're tr the reason why we're having people RSVP is we want to know how many tour guides and how many groups we're going to have. So we're planning basically a loop mm -hmm. of sorts and pe starting people at different points on the loop going the same direction so they're not bumping into each other. But we're also having t two additional tours next week, which will be on Tuesday and Thursday from 4 to 5.30. Um, I guess we had forgotten that there was um, daylight savings time when we set those because our, our concern was we wanted to have it in daylight. If there is more interest, we'll plan another Saturday down the, down the road um, in doing this. And I, because I think it's, the building speaks for itself. And I think it's good to get a visual and uh, parents who have come for conferences, you've seen different parts of it, but you probably haven't seen all the different uh, places in the building or get a sense of, well, probably have a sense of how big it is. That, that, that I'm sure you probably do. But So those tours um, will be offered for people. And um, it'll be, it'll be, I think it'll, you'll find it very interesting to, to, to do the tour. Uh, I would suggest if you are going to do it, you wear good shoes. Um, one, <laughs> one of the, one of the, we have a couple of reports um, that actually Laura is going to give, and, and do you want to start with maybe doing this one here? Sure. All right. And you can explain what this is. Um, in, uh, you, and you received a copy of this by email, um, uh, and this was the survey that we sent out in February in concert with the um, AEA regarding um, the teachers' responses to the new teacher evaluation plan. We wanted to start to gain feedback as we go into our, as you know, we have a, a cycle where we go back into negotiations to talk about whether there's any need to change anything with a plan. Um, and we'll be doing, it's beginning that shortly. So we want to gain, gain some feedback from the teachers now, and we'll also repeat the survey at the end of the school year. I'm um, pleased to report there was uh, strong positive feedback regarding teachers feeling about being comfortable with the development of their goals. And we also had strong positive feedback um, about their experiences working with their goals and on their educator plans with their evaluators. Uh, the vast majority of teachers also reported that they found their post-observation meetings with their evaluators to be useful. Uh, there are two areas that we need to continue to work on and give teachers additional professional development. Um, the first is on evidence and the collection of evidence and understanding what good evidence looks like and we're going to be continuing to work on that and frankly it's going to be something that we're going to continue to work on next year because it's a d very different concept for many teachers and it's our hope to um, develop exemplar portfolio exemplars so that teachers can look at that for next year and, and the same thing around goals we'll be developing some exemplars of goals. Um, in addition, uh, the system that we use, Baseline Edge, teachers um, feel that they need to gain more expertise into that. Um, and we will be <coughs> sending Susan Bisson, who is the person in the district that works with teachers on technology and also works with our um, ed academic databases. Um, we'll be sending her out to schools to sort of do site visits and sort of be there to be uh, a one-on-one -on -one kind of help with people. How many teachers responded? 306. Out of how many? <laughs> About 500. Um, an online survey, a 50% return rate is considered to be excellent. So we were very pleased with the, the responses that we got. I, I appreciate that this was the teachers. I kind of wonder what the evaluators thought were of these different things, you know, do, do they feel that people understood how to, how well they did goals and stuff? And I'm not trying to imply that the teachers aren't right. I'm just, I'd like to know if everyone's on the same page or if there's some disconnect. Yeah, we presented this data to the, all the evaluators um, right after we got it. So sometime in the month of February, it was very close to when we got it. Um, we didn't get any feedback that people thought that they were, you know, not in line with what they thought. Um, but there will be a separate survey that will be about the, from the evaluators in order to prepare for negotiations. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Hannah. 
Regarding the evidence, and I noted that too, uh, is it possible that the, the evaluators, not maliciously at all, uh, are asking for different approaches to it? No, I think what it is is that there's a complexity of, we tried to simplify the amount of um, evidence that we asked for people to get, and I think that actually in some cases it made it more complex. Um, we were very um, specific about you only need so many pieces, and, and th some people were a little more zealous, and so if I look at my neighbor and she's got 25 pieces, and I think that I'm only supposed to have three pieces, I might start to get nervous, and so I think it's just going through the process. Just give sure. them an update on uh, review of the tool. Right. Uh, the review committee for oh. the. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't know if you were. Oh, no. If, if you have something on this. Could I? Yeah. Yeah, I wanted you to. Okay. I, I thought we were like doing the eye yeah. contact thing. Okay. <laughs> so um, I thought I was really actually impressed too by the results of the survey. I think it's closer to a 75% um, turnout of kind of Unit A teachers anyway that were um, represented here. And I definitely agree with Dr. Chesson that the whole evidence collection was the biggest problem. And I think it's just the lack of exemplars. Teachers just really don't understand what people are looking for. So I think like you indicated, after we have some good examples that we can put out there, people will feel more comfortable. And getting that um, evidence then, just the mechanics of getting it up on baseline edge was problematic as well. I personally um, think, I, I know Dr. Chesson and I and Dr. Bodie have had some conversations during the year about the goal setting, and I, I think actually people have a bit of a false comfort about how the goals process went. I think we're all still struggling a little bit with what those, especially the student learning goals, should look like across the state. I think it's still, there's been some confusion around that. So I think that's an area that we're going to need to work on um, more for next year. And then um, I think just in general, too, it's, you know, it's the first year of this brand new system. So I think teachers are struggling um, somewhat, and I think evaluators are well, are as well. And, uh, you know, what I hear, and this wasn't part of this um, survey, was, but just, again, kind of calibration among evaluators, um, you know, from department to, to department and school level to school level, I think that's a process that's going to take a couple years as well. So I think we just need to constantly be looking at what are we doing to work towards um, kind of calibration and, and uniform implementation of the system. Will um, there be for, yeah, please. Oh, I totally agree. We'll, this is something we've been working on at the administrative level for a couple of years, really, is how to improve our calibration. It is been a focus of a lot of our professional development this year and, and will continue. It's not something that you're there. You're just in a constant um, state of getting better at it, which is exactly what the, the spirit of this new system is, is how do we continuously improve our practice? And so there's different parts of that and we, we're, I think we're off to a very good start. And I, I do, again, want to give a lot of credit to um, Hanson and, and Dr. Chesson because they were, uh, a great partnership in laying out the groundwork last year and uh, I can tell you from our meetings with administrators the, the thing that I hear over and over and over again is how much they love the conversation the technical part of how do you schedule all the conversations and fit them in and is this the right time and then scrunch this week all of that is part of it but those are all sort of the technical parts of it, which we're, we're going to work on, but the substantive parts, which is really what the heart of this is all about, is, is all very good. Uh, people feel very positive about the conversations that have been happening. I just want people to know that I know today we had a half day of professional development and it was all on the teacher evaluation system again. And um, I'm in, in Lexington, we're divided into two cohorts, those who went this year and those who won't start till next year. Um, and I'm in cohort two. And we're still, so my, my part, I haven't taken part in this yet. Um, and so, uh, we are still learning how to enter. It's still the same conversation. That's what's so funny is that we're still like, and how, what, how much evidence and, and where does it go? And 
And I think that it's just because it wasn't asked for before. You know, what it used to be that they would come in for the full time and, and you they would gather whatever stuff they needed while they were there. And so I think that this is just, mm -hmm. it's, it is more about implementation. It's not about whether you need it or not or, you know, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's like kind of how do we do this again kind of. And so those questions are the same in in my district as well and so I just wanted to make sure people understood it's not I don't think any of this is unique to Arlington I think every district that's implementing this is seeing different <coughs> levels of but uh, of the same question so Mr. Schlick well we had that same professional development <laughs> yesterday in Lowell uh, where I had my teachers in and we were talking about evidence and uploading it into our system and how how do you use your evidence to to find how it correlates to the rubric items under the proficiency for the areas that, that we're looking at. Right. And what I did at one point was take a picture of my first grade team uh, with their Fontes and Pinnell books uh, talking about kids and learning and, and, and uh, interventions. And just taking that picture, collaboration, lesson planning, differentiation, uh, a lot of different rubric areas and different points on the rubric that that right. one piece of evidence pointed to and made a case on, and you're able to just pull the language out of that. It's it's not easy to do. We're not used to doing this. Right. Uh, and you know we'll get it right. And, the, and I think the the best thing that everybody understands is, you know, we, we recognize your prof professionalism. We recognize the good things that are going on in the classroom. We're doing this differently. It's going to be okay and we're going to get there. That's right. Mm -hmm. we, we take the same attitude about it. Yeah. One of the things that I think is a real plus of this new system is the exercise of actually writing your goals. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing that as a district for a number of years because I think it helps focus. And I, I, every teacher comes in with goals. And probably every day people have lists and goals. But but when you have sort of overarching goals for the year, it really does help you focus um, your, P, your PD, what you want to, you know, how, how you're going to be, what you're doing that's going to help you achieve that. And in fact, we're, we're, we, the department has been, um, in Arlington, we, we, we have, um, we read books together. And our latest book, which we just finished, was had to do with the issues of goals and procrastination, how you really achieve your, um, you, what you what you want, and of course, one of the important things, and, and you see this in all of these kinds of books, is that writing your goals down is a really important first step. And so, I think that it's, it's something we're not used to it in the sense of the formality of it, but in terms of what the payoff is going to be down the road, I think it's going to be quite significant. Mm -hmm. But we will get there, and uh, I think we're taking it at the right pace, the right priorities, the right attitude in this district. I have more. Please. Did you want me to do two? Oh, yeah, please. Okay. Yes. You have um, two. Uh, so the review committee for the Tools of the Mind curriculum met last Monday to hear the concerns of the petitioners and those who supported their position. And then on Thursday, the same committee met um, to hear the position of the teachers who mentor all the uh, kindergarten teachers and those who support that the position of the use of those materials. Um, the committee met subsequent to the meet, uh, both meetings to review everything that they've heard. Um, Becca Steinitz, who met earlier tonight, um, a parent and community member on the team, drafted a report and with feedback from me. Um, this report was just completed today. We'll be sending out this report tomorrow to all the members of the committee to ensure that we're all in agreement that that's what we heard um, and that our recommendations that we wanted to make um, based on what we heard um, were in agreement on those. And then any feedback that we would get back from the committee if we misheard something or misstated something will be incorporated by mid next week and then the report will be given to Dr. Bodie for her consideration. So that's where we stand. Any questions on that process? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chester. All right, um, I just want to give you a quick update. We, uh, we are moving forward with Fratton as well. We talked about the high school earlier, but we do have a building committee and we are meeting monthly. We met yesterday and Three members, we break down the subcommittee for different purposes during the month. And last month, um, a subcommittee actually compared all the square footage of the different schools just to see how Fratton compared in terms of parity. Because that is the question before us. 
how are we going to, what, what improvements do we need to make at Stratton so that there's parity? And of course, what, how do you define parity? So one way you look at it is in terms of spaces. And um, the, 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 what came out of that, and we're gonna be digging more and, and, and the next step is to actually get an OPM, an owner's project manager, before we actually are able to get an architect to do the design. But what we, in broad strokes, and I can, sh you know, the facilities committee can see this report in more depth, but in terms of classrooms, something we all know is the classroom bigger mm -hmm. than any other classrooms in town. But some of the other spaces, such as the library, mm -hmm. the kitchen area, which is a really a galley kitchen, um, the nurses, and the medical area, are smaller than other mm -hmm. Um, facility, uh, other schools. So that really sort of helps us uh, focus on really uh, what are the things that we need to do there. In addition, of course, just to the, the infrastructure, the windows, the heat, and the, the other part of the building, and part of the roof, and so forth. So this is moving along. I just wanted you to know that, that um, the goal is that we will have a recommendation in terms of cost to the capital committee for their consideration in the fall. Actually, we'll have a, a, a proposal, well, a recommendation probably late August, and then that'll get refined over the fall. Mr. Hanson. Uh, with the intent to uh, be part of the town budget or the, the budget for the following year for implementation? Well, the, the how that gets financed is mm -hmm. gonna be a lot of discussion of capital. I, I can't comment on it quite, quite I mean, yet. It, the intent is to, I thought the capital planning committee is already committed to to support uh, the, the issue of parity. They, absolutely, they're the ones who define the okay. charge. Um, what that amount of money will be, what the timetable will be, and all of that will be worked out. But that right now, they want to know what what is right. it going to take for parity, and how much is it going to cost. Right. Parker Ellison. Um, I'm wondering when I think about parity and thinking about Stratton and some of you know like the Thompson. Part of what I see are more the finishes, the new, you know, the bright new shiny tile and, and the, the windows and the walls. And I'm wondering how, you're, how that's being taken into account um, when you're looking at parity. Well, that's certainly the first thing people talk about when they talk about parity. Yep. And uh, so that is definitely, that definitely would be part of going forward. What the cost will be, you know, this, Clearly needs paint, um, but we've heard a lot about paint, the molding, and th th that's the all paneling. come up. The paneling, many times, um, but that will happen. The, the idea is to also update that as well. But the parity issue is like what are the the really important things? That's what you really have. The big rocks. That's what you have to get in place first. And the other part of it is that we want to be creative so that we don't have to change the footprint of the building because as soon as you do that, mm -hmm. you're then getting into a lot of money. So there's some very creative ideas. We just now probably need, we're, get, we're really getting very close to the point where we need to have an architect, but we have to go through um, a process. And in fact, Diane may want to talk a little bit about this so you're aware. We will be working on um, going out to bid to get an owner's project manager. We. Under Massachusetts law, procurement law, you have to have an owner's project manager on the case mm -hmm. before you hire the architect in a project that you expect to exceed $1.5 million. And based on the on-site insight report of the mechanical systems still needing to be upgraded at the Stratton, we will well exceed the $1.5 million threshold. So rather than doing partial work now and then having to rebid everything later down the road, if we, if we do the bidding for the OPM, and then bidding for the architect, then we can just roll through from the project, hopefully from a feasibility-like spot all the way to a construction spot without having to go back out to bid. Mr. Wait, what's the source of funding for this? The capital budget. Thank you. Ms. Starks? Um, as someone on the um, Stratton Building Committee, I want to know that uh, I think that the best part was that the other thing we talked about was that there's basically three main categories of things that we're looking for. One is systems and things that absolutely need to be done, like the heating and that kind of stuff. 
The other one was, as you say, decor and technology. That was like a second bucket. So these were like three big buckets that we're looking at. And the third one is kind of parity in size and space internally. And so I think that those were kind of what we were, that's kind of the way that the group is looking at this. So um, kind of looking at, okay, if we look at each of those buckets, what would we do? decor and technology wise that would bring it up to parity what would we do you know as far as a kitchen and a library and a, that kind of thing and then what is the what are the absolute like if you look at the insight report like what systems actually we absolutely have to do you know heating or whatever and so i think that um it might help people to know that those are kind of the three big buckets that they're looking at and then kind of what the committee's trying to do is try to flush out kind of what those things mean um, for, for moving it forward, so. That's very helpful, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I think that, that. Thank you, thank you. And why is Decor and Technology group together? Just why aren't uh, I don't know, it was just one buck, a big bucket, and because I think that they're, they're f actually fairly small pieces, so you put them together in one bucket. I mean, I don't think cost-wise they, I think they make a huge impact, but I don't think cost-wise they're a huge, comparatively to building expenses. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they're a huge okay, portion. And so we were trying to get our process. heads around, yeah, 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 just, you know. Roof, windows, boilers, floors. Big, big cost. That's gonna be big the big cost. stuff. Yeah. You know, electrical service, rehabbing the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's the big bucks. If you need to move walls around or renovate up another space, I mean, those will be costs for sure. But you don't wanna, you have to be, Thoughtful about this. You want to make sure that what you're, you know, the plan's really going to solve the issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But thank you, Cindy. That's that was terrific, and thank you for serving on this. It's a great committee. And they're probably in it for the long haul. All right. Um, more of these are, are very are quick things that I want you to be aware of. Um, in athletics, um, we've had. Notables in the last uh, month, the last couple of weeks, and one of them is congratulation to the the AHS Five Hundred basketball cheerleading team, because when they traveled to Western Mass this last weekend, they entering into the MSSAA cheerleading contest, they came fourth in the state. <coughs> And also, our boys' hockey team this year went into the quarterfinals for the Division North, and we haven't gone that far in a while, and they played a terrific game, and very proud of them, and proud of their sportsmanship, despite their disappointment, so it was, it was terrific. Um, we also had, like speaking of hockey, we, um, we may, it may, I'm not sure when it's going to happen, but we had a student in the high school, the story of uh, how he donated his stem cells to his father, um, uh, CBS was here the other day doing some filming on that for the morning show. So that story probably will be there. Um, I don't know when. They didn't, they didn't say. The, um, another another uh, point of congratulations is to our middle school students who participated this year in the Nat National History Day competition. Last year they did fantastic. Remember we had a team that went to nationals? Well this year they, they had the regionals in uh, April and four, or six, oh, six of the teams that went into the regionals, so the 16 teams from different middle schools, six are going to the state. And of the others, four <coughs> uh, received honorable mention. And some of these topics that they are talking about in their presentation, they present to a, team, a panel, are very, very thoughtful and in some cases controversial topics, and they have to submit a bibliography that, is, that has a lot of primary sources. And I know that um, a parent posted, we were trying to find where that posting was the other day, really just how impressive these students were at the competition. But to give you an idea, um, one group that I think is going on to states had a topic of uh, consumers versus animals, the debate over animal rights and cosmetic testing. Um, then another, another topic that did go on to states is 
children during the Industrial Revolution. The government recognizes the need for child labor laws, so exploring that topic. They also had civilizing savages. Do we have the right to change a culture we do not understand? Another topic was the Vietnam draft, the effects of a forced responsibilities on the perception of rights. So these are pretty weighty topics that our middle school students did an excellent job on. So we have a lot to be proud of and we wish them well in states, which I think is happening in a couple of weeks. So we may have a, some more success in that area too. Um, uh, congratulations to our middle school students also for their performance for Guys and Dolls. They, it was a very lively production and I, I was impressed how many students came out for the, for the show. Uh, not only to be in the show, but actually to, to watch it as well. And at the high school, the next uh, musical is going to be the first weekend in April, and that is Footloose. You'll probably hear about that at the next meeting as well. That's an old thing. Another um, thing you just need to be aware of, uh, not that this is open, I, I don't believe it's open. Well, actually, it's an open meeting. Uh, Secretary Malone called us um, several weeks ago to see if we would be willing to host the school safety and security task force meeting. They try to move it in different places, and so we are. And that will be held at Thompson on Tuesday, April 8th from 5 to 7. So at least it won't and be held here. I believe that they're expecting spectators as well. So here. We're, we're setting it up so that the committee has their, you know, the, a sort of a, a U-shaped a conference area. But I believe that they're also going to have seats. So if anybody wanted to attend, you're most welcome to do that. The... Um, well, you know, it's Pi Day, and I also, the February newsletter, and I want to thank my team that helped with this, um, Betty Bodos and Julie Don and Claudia Patoli, because this, this particular one is very long, but it, you can't help but see all the different things that are going on and be very proud of our students and our teachers and all the great things that are going on. And one of the things that, um, that I was very happy about is all the community service projects that our students participate in. Uh, that level of awareness that they, they see a need and they, they, and that they follow through and, and do some really wonderful things. One of which, as you know, we have um, the Sister City and mm -hmm. um, we've been gathering um, books and pencils and Spanish books, I should say, and pencils and and any kind of school supplies that might be helpful for the school down there, and we just sent off 500 pounds. Wow. <laughs> yeah. so and they, the students did this. More than one stamp. More than one stamp, yes, they did have more than one stamp. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just double check, is there anything else here? Moving on, uh, consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of those items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant 14126, dated February 27, 2014, in the amount of $490,209.32. <coughs> approval of draft minutes none. And a motion. So moved. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those against? Okay, subcommittee and liaison reports. Policies and procedures. Mr. Fieldman or Mr. Slickman, whoever would like. Uh, so we're going to move uh, the second reading to eliminate policy BEDHA, escalating issues, and GBK, staff complaints and grievances. I guess we'll do, that's why I moved that we eliminate BEDHA. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Now I move that we eliminate GBK. Second. Any discussion? Aye. No. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Great. Nice. Right. nice right. Time. Yeah. We All know. those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Ask. We meet on the 18th at 7 o'clock. Rebecca Bryant is coming, so I'm conscious of this fee issue, so I'm not sure where we... Do you want to make it a short meeting? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> okay. What are you going to discuss with Ms. Bryant? Policies. 
You asked for that yeah. one. <laughs> I'm sorry. If she comes to my meeting, we'll talk about budget. Yeah. <laughs> really? Policies. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what's like. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, we can set the agenda. Yeah, there's an agenda. I just don't have it with me. Oh, okay. There's about ten policies on the list. Yeah, that she's researching, well over the retainer apparently. Oh, goodness mm -hmm. gracious! Yeah. One of those interesting oddities that we discussed <laughs> at the last meeting yes. was the consent agenda. So why do we have to read all that consent agenda language if we only have one item on the consent agenda? Hmm. I also have a have a. Plan to eliminate the secretary's report, but we'll reveal that in a few oh. days. Oh, public. The oh, public file. Public public the public reading. Yeah. Why do I have a public mm -hmm. reading? Sorry, it's just. That's right, it won't be my job soon. Well, you can have it back if you want. Mm -hmm. Anything no, I else? Don't. In, in <laughs> no, that's enough. It's great to see you here tonight. Good to be here. <laughs> well, how was the concert? It was great. Yeah? yeah strings? Was, strings? Yeah, I stayed for the first part, and then there was a mem memo not to leave, but parents were leaving, so I just left. You have a duty to attend to. Thank you. Ms. Starks, budget. Um, all right, we're going to start with uh, the second reading of a file to policy KF-E, which is the fee structure for rental of school building space. Um, I move that we accept uh, the change, which adds group four, and moves the date uh, for applications uh, so that uh, when we set the rates uh, to March from May. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Abstain. Abstain. Oh, All right. Um, and uh, as uh, Kathy reported, um, we have uh, on Monday at 7.30, we will go to FinCom. That's in the selectmen's room um, and talk to them more about our budget. Uh, we had the budget revenue task force on Monday. Um, and uh, at that, they gave out a very good um, one pager, which I have, and I can make more copies of if people want, although it has my notes on it, on to, as to how the town uh, figured out how to give the schools more money. And um, we discussed that. I thought it was very well received. Uh, I was fairly glad um, about that. Um, and so that is in the long range plan now, um, which has us without deficit until 2019. Um, so all of that seems good. Um, what else did I want to say? I have it written down. <laughs> um, and I believe, although I haven't read it yet, I think the Metco thing that Charlie and I wrote made it in the paper. Did it make it in this week? Yes. I haven't read it. Okay. Yes. So I sent it to everybody. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted everybody to know that I was working on that. Um, and the only other thing I have is a question which has nothing to do with budget, um, except the advocate request. Hmm. So the advocate sent us mail. They want us all to answer these questions on the high school, and I wanted to know how you wanted us to respond. Do you want? Um, I just want to reply all and deliberate. <laughs> you want to do that? So. <laughs> I don't know if. Well, I no, I didn't know if we wanted to respond as a committee. I mean, he's looking for individual responses. Yeah. Well, and he doesn't I'm just, say. Well, doesn't it say. went to everybody. Right. Each kind of individual. And it says you can be quoted. Uh huh. But I just. Mr. Hand. I, I think we're all on the same page, but it, I think it would be detrimental if if one of us said something that might be, slightly off the reservation or something. Uh, I don't know how we'd do it, uh, keep it to a subcommittee or what. I don't know how quickly he wants it, but uh, or just assign some willing person that wants to do it for us. Well, any, anybody could reply if they want to, but no, if, we, I understand if, we, that. if we feel that we want to have a unified voice, we could just direct the chair to reply. Right, that's what I us. didn't know if we wanted to I, individually I would, reply. I wouldn't mind, uh, Ms. Hein, and okay. then Dr. Austin after. In a motion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want to say something Fine. before the motion? Yeah, let me okay. say, so, um, I would say the advantage of having all of us respond individually is we have the potential for getting more inches of space. And given that we're concerned about ramping up the visibility and the awareness of the high school and the need for rebuilding, I think that's a good thing. But the question I have for Dr. Bodhi is, is there any way us talking about it in public impacts the SOI in a, in a bad way? If it, no, quite, if it's, I would okay. say quite the contrary. 
Okay. One of the things the MSBA really wants to know is that the community, and particularly at this stage, it's, it's really the, the, the leaders in the community are very much in favor of moving forward. There's always an, uh, an education process that goes on, and we've already begun that. I, I imagine it will, in fact, I'm confident we'll continue doing that because um, people have to, there's a price tag that's going to happen with if we were to be able to be invited in and then as we move along to the point where we're actually going to build this, uh, build, make the changes in the building. So no, I think that the more that people talk about this, the better it is. Um, our, the SOI is, is a document that we're refining and, and people are making suggestions and we're going to, the goal, the goal would be to make sure it's done by next Friday because I'd like the Board of Selectmen to have it for their, you know, their vote on the, mm -hmm. the actual language. But we're planning to submit it on the 25th. So that, that is a document that uh, we will certainly also put on the website once we get the final document so people can see it. The more we can educate people about this building, the better. Okay. So if I might say to our fellow committee members, I would think if we just phrase things like, to me, the most important thing is blah, or right. you know, okay. instead of speaking for the committee, you're clearly yeah. just speaking for yourself. Right. And, but I think the more that we can stir things up. Right. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure before we, you know, I didn't want to deliberate over email. I just wanted to make sure we brought it up. And All right. So everybody will individually respond. All right, cool, thanks. That's it. Um, community relations. Nothing. Curriculum instruction assessment and accountability. Nothing to report. Facilities. Nothing at this time. Okay, I'd like to uh, entertain a motion to vote a, an organizational meeting on Thursday, April 10th at 6.15 p.m. Oh, Thursday, April 10th at 6.15. Second. Second. Uh, discussion? Oh, All those in favor say aye. 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 Yes. Okay. Have an organizational meeting. She's oh, going to abstain. Okay. Sure. It doesn't impact me, so I do not feel <laughs> proper voting for it. You're not going to come and wish us well? Of course she is. The majority of our Lutonians do and watch you from the couch. <laughs> <laughs> Secretary's report. Ms. Starks. All right. Seeing as it might be one of our last. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. Just telling. All right. Correspondence for the school committee since our last meeting. Um, we received the following correspondence. Commissioner's weekly update dated February 28, 2014, forwarded by Dr. Bodie. Email about the prioritization of our paperless needs and an update on how the process is going. Email of the article in the Globe about the AHS hockey goalie, Mike Schiller. Email from parent Lonnie Savitas. I'm sure that's not how you pronounce it, I'm sorry, in support of the Tools of the Mind curriculum. Invitation to see the OMS production of Guys and Dolls on Thursday, March 6th and Friday, March 7th. Email from Dr. Bodhi about AHS reports and renovations and parent meetings and times for tours. Presentation handouts from the March 3rd parent presentation on the Tools of the Mind curriculum from Kathleen Coughlin and Mike Vardabedian. Email from Kate Leary, a hardy parent who supports the Tools of the Mind curriculum. Invitation to the AEF Trivia Bee on Sunday, March 23rd from 3 to 5 p.m. at Town Hall. Dr. Bodie's February Superintendent's Newsletter and an email request from the Arlington Advocate for School Committee members to answer some questions about the high school rebuild. All right. Any further discussions? Seeing none, executive session. I'd like to have a motion to enter executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union which in held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect and to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares and to discuss the uh, special education director's contract for Ms. Allison Elmer. So move. Second. Roll call. Aye. 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 We're in an executive session. Aye. Aye. I know.
Um, do we need a motion to go back into open session? We're back in open session. We're, we're back in, in open already. session. This is amazing. Automatic. Uh, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Again, go ahead, Colin. You're on the air. Mr. Schlickman. <laughs> Hello. I, I move we approve the uh, contract for Allison Elmer, our next uh, special Ed Director and authorize the Chair to sign the document on our behalf. Second. Discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Abstentions? I would be happy to sign this tonight. Uh, no further business? Motion? To adjourn. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Great. We are adjourned. See you on the 27th. It's been a good week. It has. Seven. Seven here.